the gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. Bonjour à tous, bienvenue à Titans of Nuclear. Uh, today we are in uh, the World Nuclear Exposition. We're in Paris, France. Um, and today we have our guest is Andrew Storer. He's the CEO of the Nuclear Advanced Manufacturing Research Center in the UK. We're thrilled to have you on again as a, test, as a Titan of Nuclear. <laughs> um, the last time you joined our podcast was in 2018. Wow. And a lot has changed in the nuclear industry since then. Um, in the UK, internationally, uh, overall, what updates do you have for us since you last joined? A lot has changed. Um, five years isn't a long time, really, but I guess uh, in nuclear, it seems to have seen lots of changes. I think in terms of Britain, first of all, we've gone through uh, changes of government, people in government, sorry, the same government, but changes of people. I think we've had three prime ministers maybe in that time, I think, maybe three, maybe four, who knows. Uh, Secretaries of State seem to come and go very quickly. Ministers go, uh, come and go very quickly. Uh, but officials uh, seem to stay longer. They've got to stay in power. Um, we've gone through Brexit, uh, which has had um, some positive effects, I think, on, on the UK uh, landscape. Not all, some, some difficult uh, uh, issues have, have developed, but I run a research centre, as you know, and so it's it's meant that the UK government's put more effort into its research, so we can try and compete outside of Europe. So um, I think that's been a positive for research. But if I reflect on the where we were five years ago, I think we were probably looking at uh, Hitachi building at uh, Wilver on Anglesey. We were talking about uh, Westinghouse building at Moorside in Cumbria. Um, and there were other developments going on. We've got small modular reactor developments that were happening or going, emerging about to happen. Five years on, well, none of those things are happening. Right? We, we've now got another SMR competition, unfortunately. Uh, Hitachi are not here at the moment uh, with a larger reactor, although they are here with a smaller reactor with GE. So I think we've had lots of policy discussion, lots of positive discussion, really positive. We've now got our first nuclear minister, which is a real step forward. We've got both governments really positive about uh, nuclear, which is really, really positive. In fact, I think they're arguing about who's going to do the most nuclear, um, which is really good. So there's lots of positives. But if I, if I really reflect on material impact of what's happened, it's like it's, it's been one step forward and, and, and two back at, at, at times. Also, though, I've just come back from a trip uh, from Australia for three weeks uh, on business looking at AUKUS, Australia, UK, US submarines really positive you know they've not got a regulator nuclear regulator they've not got a nuclear supply chain they haven't got a nuclear technology so i was there looking at how they could develop a nuclear supply chain how they could look at a regulator with the us and in fact i was interviewed quite a bit there talking about how they could when that's set up how they could sweat the asset and kind of go further into civil nuclear so i met the shadow uh, leader of the, the opposition uh, who's very pro civil nuclear and submarines um, who knows, he might get into power soon and maybe Australia will develop. So there's lots of positives in the last five years, but I think I have to be honest about looking at the tangible changes in Britain. If I then look at international developments, um, I think other countries are getting on with it. That's how it feels to me. You know, we've, we've got other nations who are now pro-nuclear and looking to build nuclear. It's India, uh, US have come back, uh, um, China are building and continue to build and build, um, and France. Uh, looking at advanced technologies again. So I think there's lots of positives. I think from a selfish British point of view, we've got to start to really put some actions in place behind our words, really. Yeah, I can agree more. A lot of challenges, but a lot of new, exciting opportunities as well. Yeah. 
I think something that I've seen, especially over the past two years, is just the enthusiasm for international cooperation. Yeah. Uh, the American yeah. government has been going out and making a lot of new agreements there. Um, I mean, Australia has an entirely different set of politics than the US or the UK <laughs> for that matter. Um, yeah. But also considering our environment here at WNE, uh, I think the nuclear industry is one that is a pretty collaborative industry. You have to work very closely with governments because it is so highly regulated. Given the new interest internationally, it also has very challenges like Brexit. How have you seen those changes affect the way we can build nuclear? In terms of relationships and collaboration? Yes, exactly. Um, well, I think we've finally realized that we need to collaborate. <laughs> Maybe that was in the five years. It sounds very obvious. But I think there were companies, first of all, companies thinking they could build nuclear reactor plant, nuclear power stations. It takes uh, nations to do that, and governments. And then governments need to collaborate with other governments, other nations. Um, at the end of the day, we're all in this, hopefully, for clean energy, right? Um, and then we need to have a lot more of it across, across the world. We need to build it fast. We've seen what happened in the last five years again with Ukraine. And we've seen energy prices soar. Uh, and we've seen how in Britain, we've seen how beholden we are to other nations for products uh, and, and goods. So Britain has to take back a little bit of control. But in doing that, we've got to partner with uh, nations of a, of a similar sort of uh, mindset. And we are. So it's great to be here at WNE, uh, walking around as I've done all day today. There's so many different nations here. There's Argentina right there, there's Spain there, there's France, of course, throughout, and the UK pavilion as well in the US. So it's great. I just hope if we can see the slightly slightly bigger picture and think about how many, how many we need to build in the world, how many gigawatts of new nuclear do we need, how do we best collaborate to make that happen um, across nations? And I think we've started that. I think if we continue the journey that we're on, I think the next five years will be incredible, really. And then yeah, we started to cooperate on um, research. So on fusion particularly, fusion technologies, uh, I'm, I was part of a group that um, looked at fusion technologies um, and advanced modular reactors as well. Um, and the collaboration there across China, Japan, France, US, UK, it's incredible. Um, so I just hope that continues when we get to build, uh, build the plants. And of course, fusion in uh, Kadarash in, in France is an example of a, a collaborative project coming together. You know? Say, I'm less familiar on future technology specifically, but using that comment as an opportunity to kind of bring it down to a more personal level, um, what has your work been like over the past five years? Uh, <laughs> I mean, obviously you have different uh, priorities for that research depending on what the industry needs as well. Yeah. I think we've seen a lot of challenges, especially for the supply chain, for fuel, but also just components as COVID has affected some of those like logistics challenges absolutely. as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good question. Um, Again, if I focus on Britain, first of all, yep. um, we want to maximize the UK content in our new builds and uh, in generation and decommissioning and submarines, of course. Um, the supply chain suddenly becomes stretched because if you look at all the new builds that we plan to build and the submarines and the current generation going into decommissioning, there's lots of work for Britain to do. And you know, we've got a skills challenge now. So right. from my point of view, from the nuclear AMRC's point of view, I'm trying to show how research, innovation, can take down the demand for people. That sounds... In what way? So if, if we can make a, I won't say what products, but if we can make a vessel, um, and it currently takes about three years to manufacture the vessel, we can probably make it in 10 months. So if you can think about the, the, the hours that we can reduce that product by, this isn't for cost, this is to take the people out so the people can work yeah. on other things. So if we can start to, uh, release people back into the system by innovating in the products, uh, then I think we'll, we'll probably be better off for it in terms of uh, the amount of people we've got in the, in the program. But then talking about cost, we've got to make sure nuclear is cost effective compared to other uh, energy sources. And whether I like it or not, um, the general public probably don't care that much if the power comes from nuclear or coal. They just like the, the price in their pocket. Yeah. Like they're going to pay. So we've got to bring nuclear right down and there's ways of doing that by looking at economies of scale, um, you know, bulk buy of products and, and fleets of reactor plants, not one here and one there, but the governments have got to get into fleet uh, procurement. Exactly what we're seeing with SMR development. Uh, absolutely. You, you can then get into a real cost reduction. You look at the nth of a kind curve and start to look at the price when you've got eight or ten of them. It's a dramatically different price. If you also introduce innovation, 
you can then look at how that price tumbles tumbles further. So for me, it's quite exciting. We've also got a program called Fit for Nuclear. Um, we've got 5,000 UK companies on it. And part of my uh, trip to Australia was to try and sell inverted commas fit for AUKUS to Australia. So how do those companies get fit? And you might think, well, how does that help Britain? Well, we've kind of coined this term learn and return. So if Australian companies can come to Britain, learn how get on a nuclear site, learn how a regulated uh, environment works, learn how the supply chain works, help Britain deliver and then return, Australia can start to be more self-sufficient because US and UK have got to help Australia with their submarine program. So the less help they need, the better US and Britain will be in their supply chain. So I'm That's very excited. Building that international workforce as well. Uh, absolutely, yeah. It's a collaborative approach, uh, I think. And again, I'll repeat, going back to COVID or, or crisis with Ukraine, it shone a light on capability right. and uh, weaknesses, I think, in capability. We've all gotten used to products coming from overseas. Um, right now, you know, I'm really concerned about material supply. If we look at Hinkley Point in Britain, uh, I think there's 9,000 kilometers of cable. Where's the copper coming from for that cable, right? Uh, where's the steel coming from? And we've gotten used to buying it from certain countries. Well, maybe we need to look at where we, how we can capture materials ourselves a little bit more. So there's lots of other collaborations to, uh, to come, I think, internationally. Have you found that conversations at WNE so far have helped find some solutions or at least pose some more interesting questions regarding these challenges? Um, not, not answers necessarily, but I think the real positive for me is that it's now an open conversation. If I reflect back to four years ago and, la and last time, I think it was a bit sort of, you know, could we really talk about this? Whereas now I think it's quite an open conversation about a global supply chain and the challenges globally if we've got an overcapacity in a country here, why would we build a factory over here? Let that, let that country deliver. But likewise, if there's a shortage, let's build it somewhere else and collaborate. So it's much more honest and open conversation now, which is positive. Hopefully in, uh, in two years time, there'll be some more solutions coming forward. Um, looking back and reflecting on the previous time you were on Twinks as well. So in 2018, we asked you where you saw uh, the nuclear AMRC going. Um, and you had discussed your enthusiasm for the nuclear sector deal and working with the Department of International Trade, yeah. um, which may feel like a long time ago or just yesterday, depending on your feelings on the matter. But in 2023, how would you answer that question now? So where do you see the nuclear AMRC going for yeah. yourself, for your country, yeah. for the industry? Well, five years ago, we had one center, I think in, uh, in Rotherham, which is still there, the main center. Now we've got three. So we've got one for modular construction, the one in Rotherham for mechanical manufacturing, and one in Derby we're open for digital uh, and testing qualification. So we've grown as a, as a capability. I think in the next five years, I don't see us having more UK uh, presence. I'd like to think we have international presence. I think we've got a unique capability that partnered with organizations like CEA in France or MIT in the US or universities in Australia, for instance, I think we could do a lot more together. Uh, our Fit for Nuclear program, you know, we've got 5,000 SMEs in Britain. Uh, we've now got Fit for Carbon Capture, Fit for Hydrogen, uh, Fit for Offshore Renewables. Um, so we're trying to look at you know, the supply chain as a whole rather than just nuclear silo. So I think in the next five years, I'd like to think that was a much more commonplace program across the supply chain in Britain and maybe uh, across other countries. And then more collaborative research, I think. Um, I don't think we'll grow much more in Britain because we've got the capability we need, I think, I hope. But I do think we will uh, be much more internationally collaborative. But sure. you're spearheading those other issues as well, fit for carbon capture and fit for hydrogen? Yes, yeah. Okay, even though it's technically all under the nuclear umbrella? It, 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 it started with fit for nuclear, right. and then we've looked at what's specifically nuclear, and there's only certain elements of it are specifically nuclear. The rest are just really good business practices. <laughs> So why wouldn't you have that in hydrogen, yeah. carbon capture, offshore renewables, who knows, rail, aerospace, yeah. why not, you know? Um, it's a business um, best practice um, modules really to start with. And then we put on the nuclear bit on the top. What are some of the best practices or lessons that you've learned around these programs? From Fit4, um, the, the, the level of effort that the companies have to put in, we have to explain to them up front 
that they've, it's, it's an investment of their time. So some companies kind of go part way and then they get a bit tired. So it can be quite a, a long task, depending on the journey they've got to go. So I think the lesson I've learned is we need to be quite clear with the companies at the start. We do a gap analysis and then be very clear what their journey is going to be and the amount of time and investment they've got to make. Um, the next evolution of Fit4 is going to go much deeper. So again, we need to be very clear with the companies how, uh, how you know, be ready for the, the level of depth they've got to get to. You know? That's very exciting, all the same. Um, as we wrap up, we want to give you an opportunity to kind of share any final words with our audience. Um, what are you most excited about for the future? We have w &E now, we have COP next week, many future opportunities. Well, I think most exciting is the amount of um, younger people I'm seeing around WNE, which is you great. work with the, the university system, so that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've, I've got four children, right? And um, I'd like to think they all will have equal opportunity. Um, male, female, I've got girls and boys, but um, they're all young. And I've, I've seen so many young people here. And in our center, we've got a much younger group coming through. I hope that in the next uh, two to five years, we have a lot more female engineers manufacturers. Um, people talk about diversity and, and uh, more females in, in, the, in nuclear, but I want to see in technical roles. I want to see them in, in manufacturing roles, um, long-term high value jobs, you know, and, be, and not because we force it. I'm not saying we force it today, but you know, I don't want my daughters to get given a job because they're female. I want them yeah. to get them a job because they are equal and they are, they are equal. And we've got to keep pushing this, you know? So I'm really hopeful of that. I think, young people of the future. I'm, look at me, you know, <laughs> you know I've got to go somewhere and do something else uh, soon. And some of the other groups have got to come in with better ideas, brighter ideas, um, you know, digital, the AI, all that computer age of stuff. We've got to embrace that and take it forward uh, to the next phase. So I'm excited by that. I'm not upset by it. I've got to find something else to do maybe the next five years. <laughs> God knows what I'll do, but I've got to find something. So I'm really excited for the future of nuclear and for manufacturing in general. Well, in the meantime, you've done a lot of good things for the nuclear industry. So thank you for your contributions there. Thank and thank you. you so much for your time on the Times Nuclear Podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. And initiate at least a new approach to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversation. If the world is to shake off the inertia imposed by fear and is to make positive progress toward peace.